गुड इवनिंग एन ऑर्डिनेंस इफ इट इज ऑन अ सिविल लॉ कैन बी रेट्रोस्पेक्टिव इन नेचर प्रीतम एनी बडी कैन इंट्रोड्यूस अ मनी बिल एंड बिफोर इट गोज टू द पार्लियामेंट एंड बिफोर इट गोज फॉर द प्रेसिडेंशियल रिकमेंडेशन इट मस्ट बी सर्टिफाइड बाई द स्पीकर we had finished the extraordinary legislative powers of the president and the governor on comparison uh we are going to now look at uh the executive powers which are extraordinary in nature and in with respect to executive powers which are extraordinary in nature we have to understand something called discretion okay right no time limit given uh executive is you got to understand discretion now as i was mentioning yesterday discretion is a decision which is taken without the advice of any other authority of the same hierarchy or a superior hierarchy and that is how the word discretion sort of comes into play discretion apart from just uh, with respect to the president and governor also has a strong role to play in in an administrative sense where uh, for those of you who have law optional will definitely study about administrative discretion especially with respect to bureaucracy and and the components of it but let's understand what is important for the pre first and then we'll of course correlate it to the means in a while now with respect to uh, the discretion with respect to uh, how all of this eventually uh, works out let's understand this uh, when we look at discretion there are basically two kinds of discretion one which is guaranteed to you by the constitution the constitution specifically in the articles says that you have the right to exercise this power without consulting anybody and the only people that the president and the governor have to really abide by is the council of ministers so when we say discretion it simply means that the president and the governor don't have to listen to the council of ministers it's that simple okay now uh, one is of course constitutional discretion and the second is uh, situational discretion that the circumstances are such that you have no choice but to apply your own mind and come to you know what the right decision has to be and apply the right decision to the best of your ability okay now with respect to the president the president has zero no constitutional discretion whatsoever at all uh and the governor on the other hand of course has uh, a constitutional discretion now what is the constitutional discretion that the governor has uh this correlates to what we were studying yesterday wherein i explained to you that the governor can reserve any bill that the governor wants to for the assent of the president so in terms or of, of reserving a bill in terms of reserving a bill for the assent of the president the governor enjoys constitutional discretion which means the governor can reserve any bill whatsoever that the governor feels that must go to the president and beyond the governor himself um, of course the caveat here is that if it is a bill which is altering the powers of the high court of the state directly or indirectly and i gave you an example about this yesterday then the governor has no choice but to necessarily uh, reserve the bill for the assent of the president when we say it's constitutional discretion it simply means that it is explicitly mentioned in the constitution it is explicitly mentioned in the constitution now with situation the it's a very simple understanding of the situation that what kind of a situation would arise where the president or the governor is not bound by the advice of the council of ministers that could be when the council of ministers are actually not there 
if the council of ministers are not there then whose advice are you going to be bound by and what kind of a situation could this be where the council of ministers are not present it's a very simple answer say for example when the elections happen right and say at the lok sabha no party has a clear majority nobody is able to get to the 273 magic number which is absolute majority to form government now it seems like things are going to be unstable on that front then the president and the governor both uh, can utilize their discretion situationally and whichever party they think uh, is is most likely to have a stable government you can invite the party to form government you can invite the person to form government the leader of the party thereafter the pm right so the situational discretion is the same for both the governor and the president is to invite a political party to form government in case clear majority is not visible in case clear majority is not visible okay uh, this has been of course a matter of great controversy uh, several governors across several states um, have often invited political parties which were the same as the center as it happened in karnataka a while ago to form government uh, the courts have reviewed this uh, the courts have gotten into the modalities of it the the general convention is the party with the highest number of seats should usually be invited to form government and then after they have formed the government you can then check for confidence you can check for a majority you can ask for a floor test a floor test is nothing but testing the majority of the party in the lower house uh this much information is more than enough um as far as the prelims is concerned i do not think you will be asked anything beyond this because anything beyond this is a matter of interpretation of law is a matter of um of of very uh, circumstantial analysis which is why <clears throat> more often than not <coughs> questions don't come from here right now that we understand this now we must understand the larger discussions which are uh, if this is the case then what is really the relationship between the council of ministers and the the respective president and the governor okay as an as an extension to executive powers so we must now understand uh, the sort of relationship between council of ministers and the president and the governor so more or less is the same so let's understand this and let's let's get this right so it is absolutely clear by now that the president has zero constitutional discretion whatsoever which means the president cannot exercise uh, guaranteed by the constitution anything uh, by using their own uh, mind or their own wisdom they are compulsorily bound by the aid and advice of the council of ministers such are the provisions of the constitution so if you actually compare the president and the governor in terms of discretionary powers it is safe to say that the governor has more discretionary powers um, and more explicit discretionary powers than the the president now this is not something which is um, against the principles of unitary federalism largely because um, the president is an elected office it is an apolitical office and enjoys a massive democratic mandate it is in the interest of the center that the governor actually has discretion because the center controls uh, the tenure of the governor and therefore if the governor is exercising discretion in a manner which is against the interest of the center then the center can effectively remove the governor the governor by the council of ministers advising the president to do so 
so which is why you will notice that the governors of india especially in the last 20 25 years or so have really not taken any decisions which have gone against um, the interest of the center uh, this is not relevant for your exam but at least in the earlier years till about the 60s or 70s um, there were several governors across several states uh, and dominantly kerala where the governor used to really you know um, fight for more funds and a higher uh, special status and, and, and higher attention that the center should give to the state of Kerala. So the whole point is that the governor is supposed to, while be an appointee of the center, uh, but at the same time, the governor is also supposed to uh, represent the interests and the concerns of the states to the central executive directly uh, through the president of India, which is why this relationship becomes, you know, sort of uh, uh, tricky. Now, now that we understand that the president does enjoy uh, negligible discretionary powers and the president is bound by the advice of the council of ministers, then the basic argument is that the president is nothing but a titular head. A titular head means that the president is essentially just a rubber stamp, is just a mouthpiece for um, for the 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 work that is being done, uh, you know, by the council of ministers, and you have to necessarily agree on this. So let's understand this in terms of, uh, you know, how this works and uh, we'll get this part uh, very clearly uh, right. Okay. So let's understand this. Um, see, um, when we look at uh, whether the president is, is a titular form or not, uh, let's understand why do we say this and why can we say that the, the, the president is not merely a titular head. There are arguments for and against this. Right. Now, let's understand this. Uh, so the arguments that no, the president is not just a titular head lies in certain provisions of the constitution. And I will run you through some of those provisions so that you understand what is the meaning of, of these provisions. So first, of course, is um, Article 74, uh, which largely refers to uh, the veto powers um, of, of, the, of the president, right? Now, uh, this power under Article 74 uh, is something which actually proves that the president is titular in nature. So we're going to look at arguments on, on both sides. We're first going to understand the, 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 the reason why people say the, the veto is or, or the, the work of the president is primarily titular in nature. So Article 74 basically says that uh, now, these are not particularly to do with veto, but an extension of this. So, uh, Article 74 uh, very clearly says that the president shall exercise function on the basis of the advice of the Council of Ministers, which makes the veto powers of the president extremely weak and, and questionable because if the president breaks the advice and exercises veto, then there is a very good chance that the president, uh, that impeachment proceedings may be initiated against the president. So the real veto powers are actually from 111 onwards in the constitution, but the genesis of veto powers, the origin part of it is Article 74, uh, which very clearly says that the president shall advise, shall exercise uh, functions on the advice um, of the council of ministers, right? So this is that if the president is supposed to work on the aid and advice of the council of ministers, then aren't your veto powers basically a formality right so so that of course is is crucial and the supreme court has also had held repeatedly that this is mandatory and the president has to always uh, listen to uh, the the advice of the council of ministers right now uh, this is the fundamental argument now in this uh, there have been two important supreme court judgments uh, one has been the case of um, un rao now this case is un rao versus indira gandhi now in this case of course um, the 
the validity of certain actions by the Indira Gandhi government uh, and how did they or did they not listen to the president were called into action. The facts are not particularly that important. Um, the question was, in, in this the Supreme Court held that even in case of an emergency, the Council of Ministers are still there at the center and the Council of Ministers advice uh, must be catered to by the president. Uh, a more popular case as we would know it was the Shamsher Singh versus the state of Punjab case. Now in this, uh, Shamsher Singh versus the state of Punjab case as we would know it. Uh, in this case, the Supreme Court very clearly says that um, when we say that the satisfaction of the president must be essential, what it means is basically the satisfaction of the council of ministers to largely begin with. Right Now, um, Ambedkar has always, uh, 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 you know, had a very, very conservative view on the powers of the president. Ambedkar has always said in his constituent assembly debates that the president is representing the nation and not just the people in power at the center. And, and his place in the country is very ceremonial, which connects all the three branches of government and also has a relationship paradigm uh, with the center and the states. So that is why uh, the president must not do uh, anything anything at all uh, which goes against uh, the the ethos and the, the the will of the council of ministers so article 74 is your primary argument as to why people say that the president of india is a titular head or in fact is a rubber stamp right now uh, <clears throat> Once we understand this, then we understand are there any other provisions uh, wherein uh, the president may have some powers, right? So are there any other provisions in the constitution which say that the president is not a titular head? And right after 74 is actually Article 78. Now, Article 7, all of this is just important for the means. This is not important for the pre. So, Article 78 says that the Prime Minister must inform the President, uh, you know, duly about uh, the course of events and keep the President updated with the national affairs of the country. And this can be done in a mutually agreed uh, manner that is it a weekly update or a monthly update or a fortnightly update. But 78 does say that the Council of Ministers headed by the PM must keep the President informed and that is also why even today, periodically, the government sends a briefing note uh, to the president. Okay. Uh, second, um, the 44th Amendment of 1978, which basically said that the president can reconsider advice, can send, uh, you know, the 44th Amendment of 98, uh, sorry, 1978 said that the president can reconsider some advice uh, given by the Council of Ministers. And therefore, um, can ask them to come back to them with, with a fresh piece of advice or, or ask them to, you know, um, sort of uh, change their policy on something or recommend certain alterations to these policies. Now, this is a never ending debate, really. And the chances of this debate to actually be asked in the mains exam is extremely unlikely because this requires a from a law optional point of view, a, a larger sort of deep dive into it because there is no correct answer to this. There is no real absolute correct answer that can X uh, advice be given, can Y advice not be given. It's all sort of built out of out of thin air. So which is why it becomes, you know, slightly more complex um, as far as uh, discretion is concerned, as far as the relationship is is concerned. So so this is largely how it works. This is also sort of true for the governor. But the president is bound by the advice of the Council of Ministers under all circumstances. But the governor is not when it comes to, say, recommending to the center the imposition of a presidential rule and, of course, uh, reserving a bill for the assent of the president. And this is fairly logical that if the governor believes that the law and order situation uh, in the state is not good enough, and you require the central to take over uh, the state administration in a, in a manner of speaking, the 
the elected government of the state would not necessarily like it. They would never want president rule to be implemented in the state in most of the cases. So unless, of course, there is a larger political strategy in place, otherwise it it never really happens. So uh, this is broadly what your your powers are, what your um, sort of ecosystem is in terms of how they are and how they aren't. Right now, uh, once we understand this from the executive point of view, uh, we now look at it from a judicial point of view. I'll, I'll give you one minute to just take a note of this. Uh, I, in fact, what I'll do is I'll just make a short note of this so that it's easy for you to understand. Uh, the precedent is bound. by the advice of Council of Ministers under all circumstances while the Constitution assures the governor of explicit discretionary based powers, discretionary powers through various Supreme Court judgments like the UN Rao case and the Samshir Singh case it is amply clear it is amply clear that the precedent is a mere representation of the Council of Ministers and similar sentiments have been echoed by B.R. Ambedkar. Okay, so I'll give you a minute and you can take a note of this. All right. 
Now, uh, we look at broadly the judicial powers and then we'll continue with the rest. There is some analysis here with respect to judicial powers as well. So, let's understand broadly what do we, what do we garner from judicial powers, right? So, when we are referring to judicial powers, what we are basically saying is that these judicial powers are an extension of rule number four, which is checks and balances. The idea here is that the criminal laws or the laws have been made by the legislature. They have been enforced by the executive and the judiciary has spent some time adjudicating upon these laws and, and, and deciding whether, you know, a person has violated these laws or not. Okay. There is a difference between COM and cabinet. We'll come to that in Council of Ministers. And I already discussed the difference in the very first class. You may not remember. Now, so LENJ, they've done their job. Uh, there was, say, a criminal law IPC. The police had arrested somebody and they followed the criminal justice system. And a court has, of course, pronounced its judgment. It has gone from appeal to appeal and appeal to appeal and it's gone to the highest court. And the case has been decided. A person has been sent to jail or has been sentenced uh, death penalty and all of that. Right. Now, uh, still, still, the courts are at the end of the day an appointed institution. And both of these are, are too correlated and too involved and there is a conflict of interest for them to really have the final call. So after the entire process is done, there is still a last chance where the matter can be sent to the president and the president can basically change the judgment of any court. Similarly with that of the governor in that respective arena. So the question is, the question is uh, why? The question is, why is that the case? The question is, where is the problem here? And the problem here is a fairly simple one. The problem here is, uh, Rudra, is this the time to tell me website issues? Is this, is this the time to tell me website issues? Do you want me to stop everything and fix the website immediately while there could just be a networking issue backend? <clears throat> so the question is, why does the governor or the president in their own spheres get some judicial powers? It's because the judiciary may have looked at it from a purely legal point of view. They would have just applied the law of the land. But when you understand the idea of justice, justice is beyond just the law of the land. Justice is very circumstantial. Justice is, is very personal. Justice is very individualistic. And, and there could be reasons for somebody for doing something or the other. And that is why at the end of the day, even if there is a 1% chance that because of certain compelling reasons, um, a person may have committed a crime, may have committed an offense. Uh, in such a scenario, the president or the governor may get certain powers uh, to essentially uh, overturn the judgments of the court. Right. So this is something that we must very clearly understand. This is the, the, the hypothesis. This is the philosophy behind it. I'll give you the judicial powers. It's a five minute job. That's not the issue. The issue is understanding why. Why even after the legislature and the executive and the judiciary have done everything that they could. They've made the best laws. They've done the best investigation. Several courts have used their minds and have given a judgment. This could have been challenged across several courts. Even then, why are you getting here? Like, for example, let us say there is somebody who has been awarded death penalty. Now, if somebody has been awarded death penalty, this would have been done after a lot of careful scrutiny. At the end of the day, you are ending somebody else's life. Um, the opponents of death penalty call it state-sponsored murder, right? So if... if uh, the government is doing this if the government is is uh, uh, if, if the judiciary is awarding death penalty and the government has made laws where death penalty can be given and these laws have been exercised and the judiciary has in fact awarded death penalty uh, 
up until the highest court, you can still go to the president and ask the president that please, can you let me go? Can you can you uh, not order the government? Can you can you stop the government from from really uh, you know um, ending my life or hanging me unto death or or exercising capital punishment? The reason is because justice is circumstantial. The judiciary is supposed to apply the law as it is. The judiciary is not supposed to take into personal factors. The law of the land, as clearly and as objectively as it is supposed to be, must be implemented. Which is why we've seen several instances where, you know, um, the, the people who were behind the assassination of an ex-prime minister, they were sentenced to death penalty. And despite that, um, you know, uh, the same family or the same party had requested that, you know, their death penalty may be reduced or may be pardoned or whatever it might be. Right. Now, what we're basically talking about is a punishment. Right. What we are basically talking about is a punishment. Now, this punishment could be of any kind. This could mean that you are in jail or this could also mean that, you know, you've been awarded death penalty. Uh, there could also be a fine, but fine doesn't really come to this level. We're talking about jail time. We're talking about death penalty. Right now, what are the alternatives of any punishment? Either you overturn the judgment entirely. If a person was convicted, you acquit the person. You say that, no, you haven't committed any crime. You are free to go. So you have you have reversed the conviction. So the first uh, way of dealing with the judgment is reversing the judgment that let it be no crime has committed, no harm, no foul. You're free to go that you've been acquitted. That's one way. The second is changing the form of the punishment, wherein this usually happens in the cases of death penalty, that a person who has been awarded death penalty may usually be having their their punishment being converted to life imprisonment okay life imprisonment third would be changing the 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 extent of it changing the rigor of it changing the intensity of it right now with respect to intensity suppose uh, and this could be because of say personal reasons this could be because of a medical condition this, this could be because of you know a person has really understood their 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 mistake in this case you can do two things either either you can uh, you know reduce the the tenure of the punishment that you know what instead of 10 years you can go home in five years you can go home in four years uh, you know uh, no, no no i'm sorry if i was rude but you know i was really in the flow of the class forgive me forgive me okay so you can reduce the tenure from a 14 year to a 10 year from a 10 year to an eight year uh, you could also you could also uh, reduce the form in terms of if it is a rigorous punishment you would want to convert it into a simple punishment a uh, rigorous punishment is where prisoners are made to do hard laborious tasks uh, for example kala Pathar, you would have heard of kala Pathar in a lot of hindi movies right so rigorous is you're made to break stones which is very difficult to do you are made to do physically very compelling activities uh, you're you're sometimes kept in solitude so that's a form of rigorous uh, punishment so all of those things are possible uh, they can happen now uh, i'll be very very clear on this extremely clear on this there are several technical terms reprieve uh, commute all of those don't have to worry about them you just need to understand what is this all of this largely is like for example when you are when you are letting a person go it is nothing but pardon that you've part you've been pardoned Gharja. right so all of this largely comes under the ambit of clemency right or mercy or clemency that you know you're you're at the you're at the goodwill or at the good fortune of of the person 
right otherwise you have commutation which comes here uh, reprieve which comes here uh, so there are a lot of you know a commission which is you know it's being changed or commutation is usually this and and there are several meanings of this so you will see words like pardon you will see words like reprieve uh, you will see words like commission you will see words like commutation now these words have except for pardon uh, which is usually when you are letting a person go all a lot of the other words are interrelated in nature and there are a lot of uh, technical differences between the three and these technical differences have never been asked in the exam and will never be asked because they are not defined under under the constitution they are they are understood as legal terms but they are not defined per se under the constitution okay so so this is largely how it works now um, allow me to also give you some analytical context in terms of how this happens um, why this happens why is the president doing this and how much has the president actually done in in the context of this okay so so we'll understand all of this in a, in a fair amount of detail okay so this is how it is now let's look at some of the powers let's understand uh, you know some of the 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 judicial powers in terms of how india has sort of done and and uh, you know uh, what are they right are they wrong and and so on and so forth okay now very interestingly when we look at the constitution of india and i'll i'll tell you the exact uh, text of the constitution of india as well so when we actually look at the text of the constitution of india we understand that the words as i was telling you have not been clearly defined at all in fact uh, if i read out the provisions of article 72 for you uh, they are actually very simply written they haven't really gone into details of what they are what they aren't and, and all of those things right so we'll of course get into those and i'll i'll sort of take you to article 72 and make you understand what these powers are but let's broadly look at this on a comparative basis and then we'll understand this okay so um, let's look at the broad powers uh, as far as the the president is concerned and we're talking about judicial powers the powers to overturn the court court's decision the president has the powers to decide on any central law which means a law which is made either on the union list or on something which is in the concurrent list and criminal law or indian penal code is actually one of the first few entries in the concurrent list and and the governor on the other hand can make a law on something which is under the state law or in the or in the concurrent list because in both of these cases the states have the powers to make laws okay but the president also has uh, some additional powers because the president is also the supreme commander of the armed forces again as checks and balances and to keep an apolitical head of the armed forces to prevent martial law or you know a military coup per se uh, the president also gets to overturn uh, judgments of the of an army court which are called court martials okay which are also called court martials and uh, the president also has the powers to overturn what is called a death penalty this power is not given to the governor for a simple reason because in the case of a death penalty it is the high court of the respective state which confirms a death penalty if it is given by any other court anywhere else and it is the high court of the concerned state where the crime has been committed where the trial has happened uh, to confirm the death penalty so we've already included an independent impartial agency of the state and because the governor because if we if we be if we leave it to the governor the governor is anyways bound by the advice of the council of ministers and the president at the center if it push comes to shove so might as well give this power to the president of india so this is largely how a death penalty and precedent and all of that works this much information i think is is sufficient as far as the the prelims is concerned the the relative article as far as the precedent is concerned is article 72 and of course 164 onwards um 160 onwards for the governor
okay but this is this is more than enough as far as the prelims is concerned we don't need to know anything beyond this now why has sort of this been in the news recently i'll i'll talk about this i'll give you a little bit of analysis as to why this happens right so uh, first of course i'll i'll give you some form of correlation to to what happens between the presidents of other countries right now the first is that we have to compare it to the us because it is in the us which we have a presidential form of government there's no point comparing presidential pardoning powers with another parliamentary democracy it makes sense to compare it with a presidential democracy right so let's understand this as to why are we are we talking about this we're talking about this is because in 2020 about a year and a half or so ago uh the ex president of us uh, donald trump right had granted a presidential pardon uh which the constitution of the us gives the president of the us had granted a constitutional pardon to <clears throat> the national security advisor of the us um michael flim okay who had basically uh twice pleaded guilty to the federal bureau of investigation on certain charges which are currently sub judis but uh, i will tell you which which have sort of come back into forte now now let's understand why does this happen what was the problem and so on and so forth so basically what had happened was uh, michael finn as we know him right uh, he was apparently a key functionary uh, in the whole russia's involvement in us elections and the fbi was interrogating this person uh, the national security advisor is a close aide of the president and is appointed directly by the president now um, basically uh, what had happened was uh, <clears throat> uh, in 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 this scenario the federal bureau of investigation who under an independent mandate had taken an investigation into how Cambridge Analytica and other Russian computing agencies had tried to tweak uh, elections in such a way that uh, you know uh, it could affect the outcome of the next election and apparently these these the involvement of the Russians was in favor of Trump being in power so that was why it was a question because you know you are basically protecting somebody of your own and that's that's why it it largely started right now uh, let's understand why this was the case and then let's understand uh, how does this work see the the president of the us has a constitutional right like the president of india to pardon or sort of commute sentences so pardon is you go home commute is you come to a lighter punishment or an easier punishment and so on and so forth right now uh, the us supreme court also looked into this and the us supreme court said that this is an extremely broad power and it's a power that in a presidential democracy can't really be questioned because you will then be undermining the democratic mandate of the president in a presidential democracy so i i cannot really get into this uh, a fair bit right so which is why it it became uh, really really controversial it also became controversial because the president does not in the us have to provide a reason as to why the president is granting pardon or exercising sort of clemency powers and 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 if i remember correctly i'm sorry i'm not able to recollect the the exact provisions of the us constitution but it's i think article 2 section 2 of the us constitution which uh, you know the the president gets the powers to reprieve or to pardon offenses of course unless it's an issue of if of an impeachment right so that's of course there and the us uh, uh president unlike india has a very large instance of presidential pardons in india we barely have 10 or 15 pardons in a year if in in a, in a best case scenario uh, if i remember correctly again um uh, i think the highest amount of presidential pardons in us history was you may have heard of a us president called franklin d roosevelt 
who obviously is one of the most well known us presidents right um he was the us president uh, also around the time of the world war 2 and i think i might not be sure with the numbers but i think franklin d roosevelt had given about 4000 pardons uh, in his time and that's a lot of pardons to begin with and people said that because you know you it, it is coinciding with the world war you you sort of you know uh, giving people a lot of relief from actions of of war crimes and so on and so forth um i think obama had about 600 odd tenures 600 odd pardons to to sort of begin with now how does how is this really in 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 how does this really happen with respect to india okay in the us it's all decided starts finishes with the president but in india this process is a little more detailed uh, in the us it's entirely up to the president because you have a presidential democracy so how does this work right now in 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 the cases of india the president can pardon on the explicit advice of the council of ministers there is no discretion given to the president so while it is called a presidential pardon but it's actually on the advice of the council of of ministers i'll run you through the procedure also as to how this happens um so first things first of course is that um 72 uh, gives the powers to the president 161 gives the powers to the governor uh, similarly right now uh, but governor powers as i said don't extend to death sentences right now now how does this work there's a very simple process behind it the simple process here is that <coughs> once so the petition or the request directly reaches the president reaches the rashtrapati bhavan the president then sends this petition this request to the ministry of home affairs because law and order is under the ministry of home affairs right now uh, the ministry of home affairs will then take a ministerial meeting there will be a cabinet meeting on this uh, cabinet we discussed before in our very first classes is that it's a bunch of really really important ministers who are a subset of the council of ministers so there is a cabinet meeting that happens which is of course called by the ministry of home affairs and then <clears throat> then uh, the ministry and the cabinet of meeting after it's done it refers the same to the respective state government where the crime has been committed uh, where the trial has happened to sort of take the advice of the of the uh, state government right now um, the state government receives uh, sends the advice back to to the mha the mha on behalf of everybody then makes a formal advice and this advice uh, is then given to the president and the president formally executes what are called presidential pardons unfortunately uh, our standard guide books are such that you do not find this uh, you do not find this uh so see what aditya has done is aditya has googled the number of presidential pardons by franklin d roosevelt and has told me it's about 3700 and i said about 4000 i think so that's fine aditya you don't have to google facts in class and tell me because i also have a browser opened right in front of me uh, but it's now full with with you know the class and all of that if i want to google i would have also googled and give you the exact number but that's not the point so there's a very thin line of difference between smartness and over smartness and it takes smartness to know the difference between smartness and over smartness and that's why anyways so right so this is your detailed procedure uh, this detailed procedure is is not mentioned in your books uh, and if there is a question on in the mains on this so you should actually make a flow chart out of it and if you have to actually make a flow chart this is how the pl- the, the the flow chart would be that a petition or a request is sent to the president you could write rashtrapati bhavan okay i write and send it to the rashtrapati bhavan the rashtrapati bhavan will then forward it to the ministry of home affairs 
Minister of Home Affairs will refer it to the cabinet and also uh, take advice of the respected state government. And on the basis of both of this, will make a final advice and the final advice would then be communicated back to Rashtrapati Bhavan. So this is how it is and the Supreme Court has held in several cases before that the President is bound uh, by the advice of Council of Ministers uh, in, in several cases, right? So <clears throat> there was a 1980 case, I think Maru, uh, Maru Ram versus Union of India and Dhananjaya Chatterjee uh, in, in 19... Uh, 94 cases are not relevant maru ram was a 1980 case and dhananjaya chatterjee uh, was a 1994 case right uh, acha acha you were reading his book the other day sorry aditya you remember the exact number very nice <laughs> if you say so so uh, of course uh, this is how the process works the two supreme court judgments completely irrelevant but I'll still tell you uh, there are judgments which are A. Uh, Ram Maru uh, or Maru Ram versus Union of India this is a 1984 case I think and the second is uh, um, Dhananjaya Chatterjee versus State of West Bengal this is a 1994 case this is sorry a 1980 case if i'm not wrong right yeah it's a 1980 case so according to both these cases the supreme court has held that the president is bound by the advice of council of ministers uh, when it or bound by the advice of the government when it comes to mercy petitions this is why it sort of becomes important right now um, we apply general principles of veto if the president sends it for reconsideration and they send it back with the same advice the president does not have any option but to accept it this is much like a suspensive veto it's more or less the same thing okay so this is largely how it runs i'll also walk you through some of the 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 decisions that have been taken uh, by the president or some of the decisions that were taken uh, you know where the president has sort of used these powers uh, so i'll i'll give you some really brutal examples and this is going to get fairly graphic right now so i hope that is okay with you uh, i hope you understand why i'm saying this so um, let me give you some examples i've noted them down here right so uh, yes so the first example is the example of of Gobind Swami in 2000. Now, uh, Gobind Swami in 2000 was uh, was convicted <clears throat> of of murder by by brutally killing uh, you know all of his relatives in sleep in 1984. Uh, he belonged to a poor family in Tamil Nadu, and uh, he had no choice. Uh, is because his parents were tortured over a land dispute. They were physically and mentally tortured. Um, his his uh, mercy plea was rejected many times. You can you can keep coming back to the president for this. For a, there is it's not that you have you only can make one request. You can make multiple requests. That's that's not an issue. So his merciful pleas were sort of rejected many times. And finally, uh, the president uh, considered and said, okay, you know they are not going to hang you to death um, you are are not going to be uh, killed on a sentence sentence to death penalty because the president said there were no eyewitnesses now imagine the statement the president said there were no eyewitnesses which means that the president is basically functioning like a court who decides on the basis of eyewitnesses the court does right so that was the case um, then I remember, uh, I think in 19, sorry, in 1997, right? In 1997, uh, names are not relevant, just these circumstances, these. And by the way, why am I telling you these is because you can use these as examples in your ethics that the means define the ends. This is, and this is a fantastic example of means defining the ends. Presidential pardons is a classic example 
of means defining the ends. Anyways, so in Dhananjay Singh and Narendra Singh Yadav 1997, um, convicts of murder from Uttar Pradesh uh, were basically pardoned. Uh, what had happened was in that 1994, uh, they had killed a family of four, uh, including a 15 year old, I think a 10, 15 year old girl child. And uh, Narendra Singh had um, actually uh, tried to rape the girl and the girl resisted and and was able to get away and to teach the girl a lesson um, they 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 killed the whole family and the girl now uh, very interestingly uh, the three people were the you know the were beheaded their heads were chopped off and the 10 year old uh, the 10 year old a boy who was a member of the family was actually burnt alive and this was pardoned by the president on grounds of evidence that you did not have enough evidence to do this. Uh, another instance or another example would be of, of um, and I'm sorry for using this word because this is the official name of the convict, uh, Shobit. I'm not going to use the second word because it is insensitive. It is completely un unwarranted. So I'm not going to use it. Uh, was a cobbler basically, Shomit was a cobbler, Shobit, uh, who's from the Bihar Bhabua district, um, who actually won his pardon in 2011. He had uh, basically tried to kill six members. He he basically had, he, he was given a death penalty because he had killed six members um, of, his, of his landlord's family as they belonged to a higher caste. And there was, uh, uh, there was massive, massive degrees of, of caste violence, right? Massive, unimaginable degrees. And the reason I did not want to mention the, the surname was because the surname was, and officially on record, the surname was um, Shobhit Chamar. And that is a derogatory term that the society often uses. It's also an identification of a lower caste. So the, the violence was such that he had, he did what he did, right? Now, <clears throat> Dhananjoy Chatterjee, the case that we were talking about in 1994, Right. Yes, uh, Himachu, it's not separation of powers because the final outcome is above separation of powers. So in Dhananjay Chatterjee's case in 1994, uh, basically he also had committed uh, rape and murder. And when he had committed rape and murder uh, in 1990 and filed mercy petitions to the government of Bengal, uh, he was, of course, uh, you know, hanged after 14 years. Uh, and the president rejected his sentence because uh, it was there was a delay in actually, uh, you know, exercising clemency powers. Maybe if the president had received this earlier or had taken an action on it earlier, perhaps, uh, the person may have not been sentenced to death, which also means that even if there's a death penalty, even if they say that the death penalty has to be given tomorrow and the president has received the petition today, the president under no circumstances has to decide today and does not have to necessarily say, OK, stop the hearing tomorrow or stop the hanging tomorrow. In 2003, which was uh, uh, fairly recent and also a cause of a lot of controversy uh, in and around the country. The people I'm talking about are Afsal Guru, um, right? Uh, this Afsal Guru person had attacked, uh, you know, the Indian parliament in, in 2001. And Ajmal Kasab, who was uh, responsible for the Bombay attacks, um, who was also sentenced to death. Now, in both of these cases, they were given death sentences. And in both of these cases, the death sentences were rejected uh, by the president. Uh, there is a debate on on the, the process of law and the principles of natural justice around it. But that debate is too controversial for you to get into. The exam is never going to get there. OK. Uh, the <coughs> Sushin Maru case or the, the Ram Maru case that we were talking about, uh, wherein the mercy appeal basically was of Sushil Maru or, 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 or Ram Maru, who had basically killed a five-year-old girl um, in 1995. Um, and, and, you know, uh, because of sort of caste issues. So these are provisions, these are instances that make you understand why death penalty is such a sensitive issue. 
And if you still don't understand why death penalty is such a sensitive issue, uh, please lend me five minutes of your time and I'll walk you through some fantastic work which is being done by uh, the National or University, which is just about uh, a few kilometers from where I am. Uh, and one of one of very, very dear colleagues of mine was involved in this, unfortunately is no longer with us. So this is uh, a, a, a legal, it's like a pro bono uh, clinic which runs under the National University, at the National University, several researchers and everybody here works. So it is basically, it, it's basically inspired with respect to sort of death penalty, right? Now, uh, when you look at death penalty, and if you want to sort of understand the annual statistics of 2021, and the, st the statistics are, are mind boggling, are just mind boggling, right? See, uh, as of today, as of uh, December uh, 2021, just about a, about a, uh, a month or so ago, there are currently 400 and 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 40, uh, 88 people who have been sentenced to death penalty and you will see that the largest number of people who've been sentenced to death penalty actually come from from uttar pradesh and of course the northeastern part has the least number in in a year before there were about 404 people so about 100 more people have been sentenced to death by the courts of our country Okay, now uh, if you see in terms of of <clears throat> the 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 work that has happened is that uh, 144 people have been awarded death sentences in 2021. Some have been executed and all of that, and there were 78. So we've actually seen double the number of death sentences in 2021. And as I told you that uh, that uh, the high courts have to confirm death sentences. Uh, Six uh, have been confirmed by the High Court. Uh, 25 have been committed to, to life imprisonment. 29 have been pardoned. And two have been reduced to a lighter punishment. Uh, same sort of here with the Supreme Court. But what you must understand here is that the role played by the Supreme Court with respect to death penalties is, is, is very, very less as compared to the high courts right now <clears throat> uh, in 2021 Punjab and Madhya Pradesh actually introduced death penalty for causing deaths by spurious liquor and Maharashtra also did so for heinous offenses of rape and gang rape uh, and the women and child development ministry has also introduced the bill proposing capital punishment for repeated aggravated offenses of trafficking and and women so this is largely how how this is um, right uh, uh, there is also a, a lot of caste angle to this and you must understand why am I talking about this is because uh, if you actually see the work that they've done here, you will understand why caste and death penalty play play a, a, a lot of role here because a lot of people who do get awarded death penalty in India, uh, get awarded death penalty uh, are from actually the the lower castes in the in in the country now that does not that's not necessarily because lower castes commit more crimes that's actually not the case it's because they have the least amount of legal resources to actually fight that penalty cases that is the takeaway that you that you must that you must understand in the context that we are referring to okay so so this is something that we've already gone through uh, then i wanted to show you the caste part a bit uh, this is again a a, a fantastic uh, sort of a report on on mental health and death penalty anyways uh, i'm sorry i read a lot of things online so that is why These are your landmark judgments in case you want to go through them. Uh, too technical for you, so you don't have to worry about it too much. But yeah. Then if you want to read a little bit more about death penalty generally, you'll find a lot of reports here and a lot of uh, work here. Okay, uh, right. It's called 39A because they are a free legal aid clinic. 39A of the constitution is about equal uh, is about free legal aid and, and justice for all that is why it's called 39a symbolic 
that everybody has the right to access justice. Now on my website, uh, I have actually, because this is not uh, technically in a lot of your, uh, a lot of your, uh, you know, syllabus, but I have actually written an article on death penalty in case you want to read through it. So uh, I have given it up here. So you will find, uh, you know, some articles, the assessment of capital punishment globally, uh, institutional recommendations for it. Uh, how does death penalty in India happen? What are the offenses? Uh, how does death row work? Where all can you go to? How has the important judgment sort of progressed up until here? Uh, what are the recommendations on capital punishment and what should India do? A uh, before year means I would recommend that you read it once, not right now because it's not relevant at the moment. So this is, these are broadly your judicial powers and this takes care of, you know, layer one of the president and the governor, so to speak. Uh, after this, uh, we will now get into the analysis of the governor, which is another half an hour or so. Uh, you can take about a five minute break and <clears throat> then we will begin uh, from, from that part. Right. So we're going to now look at issues with respect to the governor. You will find this uh, in main syllabus number six uh, because the mains has organized it in a way that the legislature and the executive and structures and all of those things.
Sindhu, I, I, Sindhu, I don't think a polity dictionary is required at all. Okay. Now, let's look at appointment of the governor and let's understand this in the right manner that we can. So, uh, first things first, let's get some basics right. These are your constitutional provisions. 153 states that every state shall have a governor. 154 says that the executive power of the state will be in the office of the governor uh, and the executive power of the union is in the office of the president. Now, under Article 155, it's the, it's, it very clearly states that the president will appoint the governor and this happens on the advice of the Council of Ministers. And as I was explaining to you before, it's a matter of convention that you consult the requisite chief minister also. Okay. Yes, Akansha. Uh, in the morning, they've started an additional class for you guys in the morning. One second. They've started an additional class of three hours for you in the morning till the 12th. in N batch. Okay, I'll I'll speak to them after class. Okay. Now we must first fundamentally understand why the office of the governor is a nominated one and not an elected one because in the mains you may be asked a question as to why and you should have your points very very clear. The first is, we are at the end of the day looking at a unitary form of a federal state, right? We are uh, looking at, an, uh, at a unitary form of, of uh, an, and uh, uh, a federal state, which means uh, I've taken I've taken your points into account. I'll, I'll speak to the administration. Don't worry. Okay. Right. N batch might be a little of an issue. Okay. Now, uh, so because we're in a unitary form of a federal state and the center has to be stronger and to keep the, the integrity of and the sovereignty and the territory of, of India as, as one unit. So therefore, um, you have to make sure that uh, the governor is nominated because then you're working in, in close consonance with the center. Right. The, the second reason is because the governor itself is a nominated head, is, 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 is going to have very nominal powers like the president. There's no point spending a lot of money on, on the election of the, of the governor or, or resources on the governor. The president does also have emergency powers, does also have certain additional powers that the governor doesn't. But it, and it, I understand why the president may have to be elected because, you know, you are going to impose presidential rule in the in a state or a national emergency across the country in different bits and pieces. So that is something one must understand. The third is um, an elected governor will always belong to a party and 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 therefore even if you make the law it to be to be apolitical, there will always be a conflicting interest of 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 you know ideologies. Unfortunately with the nominated governor also we've almost done the same thing. Fourthly, uh, conflicts will therefore be between the chief minister and the governor as there will be two political leaderships at the level of the states. And that could, of course, 
cause a lot of dichotomy at the level of the states. So this is why that's the case. Uh, now, recently you would have heard of the whole um, Bengal governor issue or you would have heard of, uh, you know, Tamil Nadu or Maharashtra for that matter. There has, of course, been, you know, sub several conflicts. And these are sort of conflicts that keep happening across all times. Now, um, as far as the, re as the removal is concerned, 156 clause 1 says that you hold office during the pleasure of the president, which basically means till the time the Council of Ministers want you in office. And therefore, the governor can be removed on any grounds. There are There is absolutely no uh, grounds mentioned because at the end of the day, it's an appointed office. And of course, um, otherwise, under ordinary condition, you hold an office for five years and can resign early by writing to the president. And governors have resigned before. That's not the case that it's, they haven't. Now, uh, the difference is the president is, is, is impeached, but the governor is not impeached. It's because the governor is in office as long as the central executive wants the governor to be in office which means you are essentially a political appointee who's of course made a governor on political conditions and therefore can also be terminated on political considerations. So you don't need to justify them in the constitution because you have created the discretion the second you said the governor is going to be a nominated office by the central executive to the states. And now what has happened is over a period of time, the, the tenure of the governor has become a, a burning federal issue, largely because the governor, the center has used this uncertainty tactic to pressurize the governors to make certain decisions, which often put the governor into a point of conflict, which often put the governor into a... <clears throat> into a into a point of of dissonance right so that's something we must understand right now uh, we then look at the judicial review of the governor's removal uh, let's understand this yes in bp single versus union of india the supreme court has very clearly uh, laid out certain guidelines these guidelines must be remembered for the mains exam that the governor cannot be dismissed just because the center has, you know, lost confidence and does not agree with the center's ideologies. You also cannot uh, dismiss uh, a governor because the, the governor is, is, you know, just at the mercy of the president. There have to be some, sub some you know, substantial, some, some truly important reasons. And therefore, uh, um, some safeguards, some procedures, some limitations must be built in. And therefore, the court said that if a governor who has been removed arbitrarily with the wrong intentions or for some political considerations, um, if they have been removed for the wrong reasons, they can actually take the government to court and ask the government to disclose in court what were the reasons on the basis of which the governor decided that, in fact, uh, uh, okay, uh, that the governor uh, should be, you know, uh, removed or not. Now, uh, understood this, that that it is very difficult for the Supreme Court to get into this because of separation of powers. But if it is something which is, which is extraordinary off, right, in such a scenario, yes, the governor should put their, the, the Supreme Court should put their foot down. And your concluding statement should be, the doctrine of pleasure without limitation cannot apply where rule of law exists because otherwise this would be against the very principles of natural justice and a fair application of the law. Okay, so this is something that we must very clearly understand. Now, uh, what is the position of the governor in the state? The governor basically plays two roles and this is important for the means. One is of course that you are the head of the state and second you are also a representative of the center in the state. Now, as a representative of the center, you are a vital link of communication between the center and the state and how the, the prime minister has to keep the president informed, the chief minister has to keep the governor informed and the governor has to keep the president informed. So this is mandated by the law and this therefore helps the center in discharging its constitutional responsibilities and also um, uh, is a very important functionary when a presidential rule may be imposed in a state and as the head of the state of course you appoint the chief minister you perform very similar functions like that of the president and you have similarly a fixed tenure and whether there is a dissolution of government or not the governor continues to remain in office and therefore 
this is your question on on how important is the governor the governor is important because it the governor unlike the president plays a distinctively dual role okay uh, once you sort of understood this we then look at the constitutional position with respect to the council of ministers now very similar to that of the council of ministers except where the constitution has authorized the governor to act in 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 his own discretion which is reserving a bill and recommending presidential rule to the president now article 60 163 clause 1 says there's going to be a council of ministers to aid and advise except where constitutional discretion uh, arises now 163 clause 2 is a very interesting provision it says if there is a question whether this is discretionary or not whether this comes under the ambit of the discretion of the governor or not it is the decision of the governor which will be final and binding and therefore will not be questioned ordinarily but nowadays you can question it in the court also this is a matter of constitutional jurisprudence however like for the president uh, the supreme court can't get into what advice was the president given the here also the courts can't get into what advice was the governor given but can you get into the reasons as to why that advice was given yes that is true and therefore the makers of the constitution have very clearly and explicitly uh, uh, you know conferred discretionary powers of the governor because as a representative of the center the governor has to be the eyes and the ears of the center and therefore for some independence and some discretion is required in the larger utilitarian goal of keeping the country together right so this is why it happens now uh, once you understood this we must then understand uh, how is it different from the president now there are essentially three reasons first uh, the constitution provides for explicit uh, discretion to the governor not to the president second um, the president can ask the council of ministers to reconsider an advice but no specific constitutional provision here is there for the governor and third the constitutional amendment act of 1976 has made ministerial advice binding on the president but there is no such provision for the governor that the governor has to listen to 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 the advice of the ministers it really doesn't make a difference because that was always the case beforehand uh, and if the governor wants the governor can should be you know heeding to the advice of the council of ministers otherwise of course you could challenge that 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 decision because the problem here is if the governor does not listen to you that means the governor is listening to the center and the person who can remove the governor is the center so and the judiciary can't really get into this a lot so you are essentially promoting what is called center stronger than the states so therefore it is also very easy to understand that though the provisions of the constitution it sometimes require governor's discretion but in in most cases the governor has to act in harmony uh, with the advice of the council of ministers as uh, the case called shamsher singh which we discussed for discretion in in the pre part of it because the constitution does not want to provide what is called a parallel administration these are simple points that we've discussed you just have to make sure that you memorize them they're very easy to do so i've written them in the simplest form you just have to cut copy paste and write them in the means though very honestly i don't i this i don't see this to be very likely asked in the means now what is the discretionary power we've covered this i've now giving you article numbers because in the means article numbers are important um so the governor has to discharge certain discretionary functions uh it is usually the following cases first under article 200 reserving a bill for the presidential assent to uh 356 recommending state emergency very minor but 2392 where you are also the governor of a of an adjoining administratively union territory there the states anyways have no role because union territories are basically Uh, extensions to the central government now apart from this in a very very special case um, if the governor of assam is is deciding uh, on the amount of royalty which is to be paid uh, to the district councils because you are extracting certain mines and minerals under permissible limits so because their consent is mandatory uh, under the pisa act and the forest rights act and also because they are their 
habitation is dependent on on their ecosystem the governor gets to completely decide this and apart from this we will do this in the case of special states which are or special cases where under article 371 which is followed by article 360 where uh, you have certain special responsibility uh, in cases of of you know development uh, setting up of development boards of gujarat maharashtra certain administrative uh, tribal areas of assam manipur uh, law and order in arunachal pradesh nagaland the whole disturbed area kind of a concept so you just have to throw these words in your in your answers you will not get a question which says examine governor's responsibilities with respect to states under article 371 that's not something you will be asked you will be asked a specific state issue such as nagaland but you will not be asked governor and specific states and as far as situational discretion is concerned we've covered this that when there is no obvious clarity i've given a couple of examples uh, of of wherein the governor has to act on on sole discretion and therefore you have the immunity here so there is Ra rajira versus governor of goa there is uh, br kapoor versus state of tamil nadu and anil kumar jha versus union of india where the governor has to essentially appoint somebody who is qualified enough to be a chief minister and is completely immune and uh, if you don't have a relatively higher majority, then you should not bring the party into power, right? So that is something that that is there and that is something that is the only thing that you need to remember. Even if you don't get into the technical details of these, it is also completely fine, right? Now, as far as the situational discretion is concerned, what is also very important to understand is that this is when when you don't have majority of the house then the governor does not have a choice but has to uh, has to necessarily under all circumstances has to uh, uh, you know dissolve the house let me explain this to you rather simply see the council of ministers at the center are collectively responsible to the lok sabha are individually responsible to the prime minister the council of ministers at the states are collectively responsible to the legislative assembly are individually responsible to the chief minister which means the prime minister and the chief minister can remove any specific minister from being a minister at any given point of time this is called a cabinet reshuffle you can't disqualify the minister from being an MP. That's not the power of the prime minister. But the prime minister can decide who gets to be a minister. That's an individual responsibility. But collective responsibility is that you have to make sure that you have majority on the floor of the house. Now, after the 91st amendment of 2003, the same amendment that we've discussed in the context of defection, because a lot of people were given ministerial births as a reward for defecting, we have fixed the number of ministers. So at for the center, the ministers can't be more than 15% of the strength of the Lok Sabha. The ministers can come from both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. For the states, you have a minimum number of 12 and it can't be more than 15% of the strength of the state legislative assemblies. This is your basics of council of ministers. Now, what is a parliamentary form of government and what is a cabinet form of government? We'll do this in some time when we do, you know, your other parts in a fair amount of, of detail, right? So in this case, if you've lost the majority, then you can either convene a special session or, uh, sorry, or, uh, you know, you can withdraw your support immediately and if if you do not have enough reasons to believe that the 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 flow test is is valid or if you think the, the government has to be dismissed you can do that and several times the governors have dismissed the houses like this have dissolved the houses like this with considerable repercussions right um, again this is too political which is why this often has never been asked in the exam and will not be asked but just to give you some background reading this is sort of more than enough okay now uh, further details on how dissolution happens so what happens is different governors have different approaches basically as long as you have majority support the governor is bound by it but if you don't have it then in some cases the governor have the governors have refused to dissolve saying are kuch to kar lo dekh lo kuch idhar udhar ho sake while some have said chalo theek hai let's dissolve right now the basic question is is the governor an agent of the center or not 
see uh, the governor is an appointee of the president owns holds office during the pleasure of the president is bound and the president is bound by the advice of the council of ministers which means the the council of ministers are the ones who are going to tell the governor what the governor can or cannot do the constitution however is, is strictly against you know diluting the autonomy of the states which is why uh, if it's because of political ideologies or if you're trying to appoint governors to reward past actions we must try to not do so we must reform the actions of the governor and because otherwise it leads to an unnecessarily over centralization where bjp loyalist people are made governors in states just to make you know life difficult for the elected governors in the state this has usually happened in maharashtra in in bengal in rajasthan and you know so on and so forth now so when we look at say rajasthan as i was telling you these are some examples usually what you will see is in non bjp rule states you'll have a bjp ex bjp politician or a bjp politician as a governor okay you can quote these examples as they are in the exam nobody is going to stop you for it right now there are some reforms that should be done now what i've done is i've given you some points here and i've also given you a table here this is important first sarkarya commission says the governor should be from an eminent walk of life should be from outside the state should be politically detached should not be a member of the political party should be appointed after consulting the chief minister and the vice president and the speaker of the lok sabha as key functionaries and you should only be removing them on grounds mentioned in the constitution wherein there is a moral issue or a dignity issue or a constitutional violation issue very similar to that of the president this was the earliest report of 1980 uh, appointed in 1983 uh, submitted to 1988 we'll come back to this commission for center state relations also then the arc in 1969 said the, the same thing that governors have to be non political in nature and should have some experience in public life and the punchi commission actually got into a slightly more aggressive mode and they said that the person who should be the governor should be a political for at least 2 years there should be a dedicated committee comprising of the pm the home minister the speaker of the lok sabha the concerned chief minister and the vice president which still gives the governor the, the central government an upper hand and only if the state legislature um, wants to remove the resolution must be fast passed by them then maybe the center can look into it or the state can be the one deciding to remove the governor and this entire notion of doctrine of pleasure should be removed from the constitution so these are your broad provisions iske upar exam mein aayega nahi ye bas 5 6 page padh ke jaane apne aap governor mein jo important hai wo aayega प्रेसिडेंशियल में डिस्क्रेशन का इशू ही नहीं है क्योंकि डिस्क्रेशन ही नहीं है सो इन द मीन्स यू पी एस सी आस्क यू एनालिसिस ऑफ प्रेसिडेंशियल पार्डन्स और और प्रेसिडेंशियल प्रोक्लेमेशन टू एमरजेंसी जो हम सेंटर स्टेट में करेंगे विद गवर्नर दे मे आस्क यू रिफॉर्म्स टू द गवर्नर सो टू स्पीक उससे ज़्यादा नहीं पूछते वो ठीक है एंड दिस फिनिशेज अप आर थीम हियर वी विल स्टार्ट विद द पार्लियामेंट टमोरो वी नो दैट टमोरो इज ए लॉन्गर क्लास एंड देन ऑफकोर्स वील कम बैक टू एमरजेंसीज एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट ठीक है clear all right thank you i will see you guys bye bye